Good morning. Thank you, Gail. That was beautiful. Welcome to Rosedale Bible Church. It is great to see everyone here. Uh, so glad that you are with us. Uh, if you're here with us on campus or you're viewing online, we just want to say welcome. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. If you have any questions about our church or looking for any information about our ministries, you can go to rosedalebiblechurch.com. Uh, there you'll find information about men's and women's discipleship as well as our mission statement. Uh, any, any, uh, there's also a place to do a prayer request as well, so uh, you can check out our website there. Uh, I don't think I introduced myself. My name is John Doobie, and I'm the associate pastor here at Rosedale Bible Church, so thank you so much. Uh, I do have one announcement this morning, uh, direct you to your bulletin for the, for the other announcements, but I think it's the third week of every month our ministry teams meet, and so that will be this, this week on Tuesday our ministry teams are going to meet. I just want to remind you of that so you can pray for those ministry teams. Those ministry teams are our deacons, and there are a number of ministry teams that we have, our outreach team, discipleship, stewardship, fellowship and caring, French, or friendship and caring, fellowship, and did I get everybody? Elders. I think I got everybody. And they meet on the third Tuesday of the month, and they're going to meet this week. So would you pray for them as they um, gather and meet? Some are meeting via Zoom, and some will meet here on campus. I don't know exactly the details of that, but please pray for them. Thank you. I want to start us off with a verse this morning, and then we'll pray. It's a couple of verses from Psalm 145, uh, Psalm 145, verses 1 through 7. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall command your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, to do such as you have written here, that we would commend your works to another, that we would extol you and bless your name forever and ever. You are a good God. You are a mighty God. You are a saving God. Lord, let us do this this morning corporately as we worship you and give you honor. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. It's a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Let us uh, sing a, a song called uh, Stand Up for Jesus, and let's not do it sitting down, shall we? That'd be a, there's no word there. Let's come into his presence, and uh, as we continue on through the beginning of this year, let's make that determination in our hearts that we are going to stand up for the truth that we know, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the living truth. Praise him this morning.
Good morning, church. I'm going to continue the reading in Luke with you this morning. If you would join me in the Word of God at um, Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30, please. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. May God bless the reading of his word, and may we respond in great praise to him and sing. Bringing that. Uh, we're going to do a new one this morning. I'm good at bringing new songs, I know. Uh, this one is uh, uh, straight out of uh, Romans. It says, we are more than conquerors through him. Who loved us, right? And that's a, a wonderful way to start the year, I think. Um, I would like to uh, be reminded of the fact that I'm a conqueror as I start 2021. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we have that identity. If you know the Lord as your Savior, you are more than a conqueror. So I'd encourage you to learn this with us. There's some great, uh, what I'd call rich, thick text in this song because it really reminds us of some of the truths about our lives as believers. And it's got a really easy, uh, easy chorus. It just says, we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. God, if you are for us, who could be against us? We are more than conquerors. So let's learn it together, shall we?
such a great truth.
Children can be dismissed. I invite you to turn in your scriptures to Revelation chapter 3, and we'll be looking at chapters, or verse 7 through 13 today. But before we begin, the topic and the, just the, the theme of being a conqueror is an important one this morning, and we just sang much of what Romans 8 says, and I'm going to read that before we, we begin this morning, because it is, <laughs> it is our hope, it is our reality, and it is our God's saving grace that we can be conquerors. Romans 8, chapter, Romans 8, beginning at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called and those whom he also called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You getting excited yet? And what then? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, is he talking about Cadillacs, Lexuses? Big houses? No, he's not. He's talking about every spiritual thing that we need to live godly lives. Who then? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. It doesn't sound like we're being conquerors here, does it? But we are. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, We conquer through the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning eagerly anticipating what you are to bring to us through your word. Lord God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say this morning. I pray these things in your Son's name, who makes this all possible, who through him we are more than conquerors. Amen. Well, again, I ask you to turn to the book of Revelation. And this morning we continue our series in the book of Revelation, the the triumph of the Lamb with Christ's letter to the sixth church out of seven. The sixth church out of seven. It's written to the assembly of believers in Philadelphia, the faithful church. Now, before you think or get the idea that I'm talking about a city that's in Pennsylvania, you are sadly mistaken. 
because this church or this, that was in this city had the opposite, acted the opposite way that uh, the Philadelphia and the United States acts. The ancient city of Philadelphia, known as Alishur, located in Turkey, received its name because a king of Pergamum named it after his brother. All right, so th there you go. His name was Adalus Philadelphius. It's a city of brotherly love. City of brotherly love, and that's why I can safely say that it is not the city in Pennsylvania because I've seen what they do to their people who play football and baseball in that city. They're not lovers, believe me. Well, the city of Philadelphia was located some 25 miles southeast of Sardis. Now, this is important because I need you guys to listen because it's all important because of what Christ says to this church. It was located in a river valley surrounded by volcanic mountains. All right, so volcanic mountains. And it, they were still active in the day. So when a volcano goes off, if you've ever seen pictures of Mount St. Helens, ash blows up in the sky, and, and then ash comes down from the sky, and that's really, really good for soil around the area. They were known for their verticulture. They grew outstanding wine. I guess it would be the Napa Valley of Asia Minor. Well, being surrounded by volcanoes, there's another thing that goes with that. Seismic activity. There were earthquakes, always earthquakes. And in fact, two major earthquakes happened in that city that leveled it. It was destroyed. In 17 AD, some 80 years before John wrote this book, it was leveled. And then the emperor at that time, Tiberius, cut their taxes. They didn't have to pay any taxes. It was like a stimulus package, I guess. And they were, able, they were able to rebuild. Well, they, with such brotherly affection for the emperor Tiberius, named their city Neo-Caesarea. Neo-Caesarea. Why? Because it's the new Caesar. So later on, some 25 to 30 years, this lasted, and then they got tired of that. The, the, the emperor died they didn't really care anymore. Then the, a new man took place. A new man took office. His name was Flavius. So the emperor, excuse me, Vespian. So they called the city Flavia after this emperor Vespian. Okay, I'm not going to bore you. It would take, we would be here until 1230 if I told, told you his whole name. All right, so the earthquake that had knocked down the city in 17 A.D. with the aftershocks. Most of the people lived outside of the city. And when they ventured back into the city, they would go in and they would start to rebuild, and then an earthquake, an aftershock would hit, and then they would scoot right back out because they were scared. Okay, I, I don't want to live here. I can't, I can't, I, I have to go. I can't stay in the city. The interesting thing about this city as well the primary purpose of this city was it was a missionary city. Now, don't think this is a missionary city for Christians. This was a missionary city to, to, to spread the word about Hellenism, Greek culture. They were supposed to send this east to Asia and west as they would go and, and to those around them. As for the history of the church in Philadelphia, no one really knows. No one knows who founded the church. Most think, okay, it must have been faithful disciples of Paul when Paul was in Ephesus. But what we do know is the, faith, the church remained faithful longer than any of the seven churches. They had a Christian influence even after the Muslims invaded the country there. And there are still churches in Philadelphia today and Athias today. I just believe that we will be blessed to hear what our Lord has to say to this faithful church this morning. It was what I needed this week. It was what I needed. Would you stand with me as I read this morning's passage? Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, 
the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have kept, have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you, uh, what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading of his word, and may we draw comfort and strength to be able to persevere and be faithful servants of the Lamb till He comes to take us home with Him. You may be seated. We have become accustomed to, it's Jesus who's the counselor. It is Jesus who gives the words to His churches. He introduces Himself in a relevant establish why he has the authority to bring hope and clarity to what each particular church is facing. The bottom line here, God is sovereign and God is holy and he owns everything. Please look at the second half of verse 7. Well, first we see these words, the words of the Holy One. Do you know what that signifies? That is no less, no less than the Old Testament statement or the Old Testament title for God. The Holy One. Jesus is calling himself that. He introduces himself thusly. You see that in Isaiah 40, 25, and 43, 14 through the Psalms. The Holy One. That is who he is. In Revelation 4, which we will be at in roughly two weeks or so, the living creatures who are around the throne say this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they continually say that forever and ever. And you think I get old and boring. They're not boring. They're just declaring who God is. Holy. Holy, holy, set apart. Set apart. He's above all things. The second thing we see, Jesus is the true one. What's the opposite of true? I don't need to say any more. He's true. What he says is true. What he says goes. He is truth. He's genuine. Everything that he proclaims, everything that he thinks, everything he utters is fact. Fact. This detail is very important, especially in the contrast to liars. Especially when Jesus gives promises. Because if he promises something, church, he's going to deliver. It's going to happen. He's holy. He's true. And third, he is who has the key of David, which means, means he has control over the, the authority, the control over King David's house. He is the Messiah. He is the Messianic king. He is the king that is to come. He is the Davidic king. Complete control. No matter what others may say. Well, concerning keys, Jeremy, 
when you have your key and you give the key to Jessica. I have to be nice because Jessica's making sure that I look good when getting, my, getting the words on the screen. Jessica is Jeremy's daughter. He gives the keys to the car. What does she have? She has control. She has the power. The power to do what? Well, for Jessica, the power to drive. Jesus has the power to do what? He is the one who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one's opened. If he closes the door, you're not getting in. If he opens the door, no one's going to close it. Perfection. Just, it is amazing what God has for us. He has control over the eternal destiny of humans. What he, things happen when he says will. When President-elect President Biden takes office this Tuesday, Jesus is in control of that. Hear me. Jesus is in control. And Jesus was in control four years ago when President Trump took office. It's the easiest thing for me to think about because we're... People are panicked. God's on the throne. Jesus opens the door and closes it. He puts people into power and takes them down. He understood COVID would be here. He understood that we would be wearing masks. He's still in control. The Holy One the powerful one is declaring this. He has the power to bring to pass his sovereign will. And that is who is speaking to this church in Philadelphia. And to our church here, it means you can breathe. He's got this. He's got you. Which brings us to the commendation the commendation, every single bit of this letter to the Philadelphia church was a commendation. There's no condemnation at all. This is accommodation. Now, this doesn't mean that the church was perfect. Believe me, there are no perfect churches. Why? Because there are humans. The old joke, if you find a perfect church, make sure you don't go there because then you will ruin it. <laughs> Notice I say you. <laughs> yeah, let's make sure no lightning bolts come down now. That would not be good. But they were commended for their faithfulness and loyalty. Let's look at verse 8. Follow along in your scriptures. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. Well, what were this, church, this church's works? We aren't told. We aren't told what their works were. But the Lord knew them. Jesus knew what they were. And that was enough. It was more than enough. But let's, let's do a little spiritual sleuthing here. Let's do some detective work. When we look at the Scriptures, especially the New Testament, what is meant by an open door? What are other places in the Scriptures? What is meant by an open door? And since there are a couple possibilities, and since Jesus has the keys, and since we know that he opens and closes, no one can challenge this. Well, the first possibility could be speak truth. We have an open door to the Father. All right? We have an opening, I would say a curtain. Jesus had made access to us. It says in the book of Hebrews, and I will read this so I don't mess it up. With confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Sure access. If you're in Christ, that door remains open. It's not shut. 
The faithful believers had access to God and a sure entrance into the kingdom. Praise the Lord. It's an awesome truth. The second possibility could be this, and most scholars lean towards this. It's an open door to do missionary, evangelism, and gospel work. Now, that involves every single one of you. There's an open door. Now, we would think, well, why is this such a big deal? Why is this so important? Well, during this time in history, with the common language, the Greek language, everybody spoke the same. They could, they could communicate. It wasn't everyone's native tongue, but everyone knew the Greek language. The Roman roads. People could travel with relative safety to go from place to place to place. The gospel could be shared. The good news about that Jesus saved sinners throughout the world could be given. Again, I want to reiterate, I want to keep this up. When Jesus opens doors, they can't be closed. But that doesn't mean there will not be opposition. We seem to think, okay, this is good. I'm, I'm, we're going to go do this. Opposition is the norm. Satan does not like people in, infringing on the territory. But God is the one who makes the action happen. He supplies the increase. A case in point. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul wrote a, about an open door to the Corinthian church when he was in Ephesus. And I will st- he, he said this, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. A wide door. It's there, and God has opened it. But there's still a struggle. There are those who do not wish the gospel to be proclaimed in your neighborhood, in your city. But yet, if God has opened the door, no one can close it. Ministry is a struggle. It is possible that we might often quit something that God has put on our hearts to do before we see fruition. That is why you need, I need, we need to pray and ask God, what does he want us to do? Because he also closes doors. He closed the door of mission, of mission work to Paul as well. He wanted to go to, oh, nope, nope, you're not going there. The Spirit forbid. Just because it might seem impossible doesn't mean that God has closed the door. We need to ask God to open doors for us. We need to ask God to open doors for others who are ministering to be able to step through. What are, we, what are we told in the book of James? We don't have because we don't ask. And again, I said earlier, I'm not asking for a Porsche. I'm asking for souls. I'm asking for God to build his kingdom. But we don't need to be, but we, but we that we're asking for the right reasons for God's glory, not ours. Again, for God's kingdom to be advanced, not ours. We need to be on our knees literally or figuratively to beg for the souls of those around us and away from us. We say it over and over. We need to be desperate to reach the lost. Are you? Am I? God, change my heart. Change my heart. And God can and will open doors. Well, whatever was meant, whether it's open access or open doors to reach the lost, both are truths that we have in Christ. Well, Christ continues, continues to commend the Philadelphia church, and they depended on the Lord's strength. They depended on the Lord's strength, not their own. He says this in verse 8, I know that you have little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
How many times have you gone through the children's wing and you hear them sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones who Him belong, they are weak. But who's strong? He. This church optimized the lyrics. They're weak, but He's strong. They obeyed His Word, which meant they knew it. They knew Christ's Word. They talked about it. They lived it. They stood up for it in the face of poverty, persecution, ridicule, anything the evil one could throw against them. They stood firm. And they were commended for it. They lived in a culture that was against Christ and His people. Church, I'm going to herald this for you. We are coming into a time when we will soon face ridicule. We will soon face the loss of employment. We will soon face persecution and poverty because of standing up for Christ. It will happen. There will be a price to pay for not denying His name. Will we be commended? Will we be commended? We must look at those who have come before us and be ready. And don't be surprised. Don't be surprised by this. But when, when persecution comes against us, don't look at the person who is bringing it and say, who's our enemy? Who is our enemy? Who do we fight against? It's the rulers in high places. I'm not talking about the political. The rulers in spiritual high places. Ephesians 6. That is who our battle is against. That is who your battle is against and will be against. Because they stood, Christ continues His commendation. And the neat thing that when I studied this this week, I'm reading a, reading a book every a chapter a night before I go to bed, and it's, it's helping me see how God, how Jesus loves you. I'm having to work on that, folks. I'm, all, I'm always all about God being, and He is. He is the sovereign. He is the king. He's, ugh. <laughs> but He loves you. And when you sin, when you fall, run towards Him. Run towards Him. I couldn't help but see Jesus as being excited to share these truths with this faithful church. I mean, I can always see Jesus with a stern, stern look. Verse 9, with a smile on his face. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan to say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. <laughs> now remember earlier we studied, I know it's a long time ago already, the church in Smyrna, and we looked at what it meant or means for someone to be from a synagogue of Satan. It means that Satan is actually controlling their thoughts, but it also meant that people were guilty of being only Jews outwardly. They were all about the laws. They were all about everything that they would do, all the rituals. They were following the religious laws, but discrediting the followers of the true Messiah. They f didn't believe the Messiah had come. And they were persecuting the believers. They said they were the one, the true sons of Abraham. 
Just like the Pharisees said that they were the true sons of Abraham when Jesus walked the earth. But the one who has the keys to the Davidic kingdom said they were not. This is the important part. Jesus is true. They were liars. They were liars. The one who told the truth declared it so. The one who has the key to the Davidic, the Davidic house proclaims it to be so. And the false self-proclaimed followers who were circumcised on the outside, but their hearts were not. Because they couldn't do only God can do that. And Jesus is declaring the true one is promising there will be a reversal of fortune. We don't know what happened in Philadelphia. But the Jewish folks who were condemning the Christians, there was a reversal of fortune. All things will be made right. The book of Revelation, over and over again, all things will be made right. Jesus says, I am making all things new. Not just some, all things new. I will wipe away every tear from their eye. All sure promises from the Holy and True One. But there were even better promises to come because of their faithfulness to Christ. He continues in verse 10. And we're going to slow down here. Verse 10, Jesus says this. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth to try those who dwell on the earth. Because you have maintained faith in me despite it being difficult to obey, I promise you this, the true one, the holy one, I promise you this, you will be spared from my wrath. You will be spared from the wrath that is to come. What is this trial that's coming upon the earth? in the Scriptures as the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, and probably best known to us as the Great Tribulation because Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and in Revelation 7:14, it's declared. It's a time when God's wrath will be poured out upon not just some of the world, but all of it. I do not say this with glee. I do not say this with yay, yay, yay. It's to punish the unbelieving, obstinate, unbelieving world of their sin. It is a dreadful time. Now we need to understand that the pouring out of God's wrath on those who are in Christ is not your future that Christians are promised in the Bible. I'm not saying that we will not face persecution. I'm not saying that we will not have Satan-controlled people persecute, imprison, and kill. But what the Great Tribulation is about, it's God's wrath being poured out upon the world. It clearly says in 1 Thessalonians 5, we are not destined for wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Christ took our punishment upon himself. We often read Isaiah 52 and 53. Jesus took the Father's wrath 
so we would not have to. So those who believe, so guilty sinners would not have to if you're in Christ. Well, how will they be delivered from the trial? How will this church in Philadelphia be delivered from the trial? And notice, delivered from the hour of trial. It's a set time. It's not 60 minutes, all right? It's not talking about that. It is talking for a specific time. But what can we learn from this verse? Christ declares, because you have kept my word, kept meaning obeyed, You have trusted. You have believed. You have believed in me. You have kept my word because you have believed what I've said and believed in me. I will keep you. Doesn't mean the same thing. It's not saying, well, Christ is not believing that you exist. He knows you exist. Keep here means to protect. He will protect this church from the hour of trial. Well, how will he protect and keep? He will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, you know me. I say this many times. Words mean things. And how things are written, how they are down, specific words mean things. Even as something as small as a preposition. Jesus uses the preposition which we translate from. From. It means out of, away from. He did not use the preposition through. Now we know that God walks through us through our trials. He is with us. We've seen the old picture, or the, yes, it's the painting when someone is walking on the beach and all of a sudden the footprints disappear. Where'd you go? That was me carrying you through that. Christ carrying you through. He's not saying that. He's going to keep us from. John Valverde has written, and I quote, As the horrors of this tribulation period are unfolded in the following chapters of Revelation, it is evident that the promise here to the church in Philadelphia is one of deliverance from this time of trouble. He goes on by saying, the event in view here that will deliver the true church from the tribulation is the rapture, which must occur prior to the tribulation for this promise to have its full, of fu- full force. What is said emphasizes deliverance from rather than through. All right, so you're telling me that this one verse teaches this. Yes, this one verse does teach it, but... Let's look elsewhere where, where it's taught. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. Keep your, keep your thumb or your finger if you have a paper Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now you're going to ask me, he said, Danny, you, you've been talking about the rapture. Rapture, I don't see rapture in this, in this particular verse. Rapture comes from the Latin rapio, which translated rapture. It means to be taken up, to be snatched away. And that's where we get the term rapture from. But verse Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, that word where we get rapture from, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now, as far as the, as the church in Philadelphia was concerned, this promise of the rapture, the snatching away of the church, was an imminent hope. It's an imminent hope. They were looking forward to deliverance. And again, I am not saying that we will not face persecution. We do. But we will not face the wrath of the Lamb. Well, after the tribulation begins, those who are saved then, 
when they're saved then, and there will be many who are saved, they're clearly persecuted and most are killed for their faith. There's, there's no getting around that. Most are killed for their faith. But it does seem that believers will be able to tell when the tribulation begins. But Christ's coming has always been promised to be at a time when no one expects. Christ now gives the challenge. He continues his promise in verse 11 of Revelation. He says simply, I am coming soon. It's been 2,000 years. I am coming soon. Soon means something that will happen suddenly, not necessarily immediately. Peter warned in 2 Peter 3. He said, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following our own, their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are containing, continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. What? A, he's not coming back? Oh, yes, He is. And He will come suddenly. As we see elsewhere, like a thief. A thief does not tell you when He's coming. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown, continuing in verse 11 of Revelation. Now remember, this is not condemnation. This is Christ exhorting His people. He's commending them. Hold fast. Just like last week, Jesus uses a negative statement to reinforce the positive more powerfully. Wow, this, this is truly great. A robber wouldn't and couldn't use the crown for themselves for their benefit. If your crown is stolen, is someone going to show up to the pearly gates? Please, I'm not saying there's pearly gates. Peter's not waiting there for us. I'm using this analogy. Someone's not going to use this and say, here's my, here's my entrance. No. No. Christ is only... They only do this to try to steal, to deprive a faithful of their prize. No, there's so much more to look at concerning the promise of deliverance that we will pick up in a future date. How's that for a teaser? Know this. God is in control. He has the key. He opens the door. He shuts the door. then this glorious promise of reward is given. And again, I picture Jesus with a smile and a look of affirmation. Now, can you see why we sang about conquering? Why I read about conquering? And we're going to see Christ say this about conquering. The one who conquers... How do we conquer, church? Is it through gutting it out? It's only through the blood of the Lamb. Trusting Him. Trusting His work. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. The one who conquers, the one who holds fast to Christ, the ones who believe till the end, the ones who have their clothes made white because of the blood of the Lamb, they, you, are promised that Jesus, what Jesus stated at the beginning of the letter, open access to God. Open access. And also, the work that He calls you to do, no one can thwart. They're promised this. 
A door that will never be shut. Why? How? Because of their own position in Christ. Three things are promised here in this last verse. Three things. Because metaphorically, we are the temple of God. We are. We are Christ's temple now. He dwells in us. Promise number one. They were promised to be made a pillar. Now what's a pillar? Dick Meyer, what's a pillar? A con- I asked the engineer and he gave me engineering terms. No, great. A column. Something that holds a structure up. He nailed it. Yeah, there there are pillars there. A pillar, it won't fall down. It's solid. It's not a little little reed blowing in the wind. It's something that is stout. Not Tom, but stout. A pillar is something that stands when other things fall. Do you think that would be important in an earthquake-ridden city? Do you see how Christ is talking directly to them? A pillar. It's going to stand. It's unmoving. And this pillar will never be separated from God. You don't have to leave this place. No matter what earthquake happens, this pillar will stand and God is there. That's promise number one. Promise number two. The name of God is written on them. I don't know what you guys think about tattoos. I don't have any. But the name of God, whether figuratively or really, it's there. What does that prove? Full acceptance. You're mine. I've made you a pillar. I write my name on you, full acceptance, full ownership. Also, the name of the city of my God. If there's a city, what's in that city? There are houses in that city. There are places to dwell in that city. And when some little puny little earthquake comes around, you don't have to run because a pill, God has set up a pillar and God is in that city And you can live there without fear of running out every time the earth moves. Jesus said on the night before he died, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many rooms. People live in those houses. Promise number three will be given Christ's new name, meaning a new identity made possible by God's transforming work. A new life. John Dewey likes to define this as an unmixed condition, which means there will be no sin. No sin to taint what we think and what we do. A future life that is free and fully alive forever in the eternal state because of what Christ did. My name. Not a name that's going to change. Not a name that's going to change every 25 to 30 years like this city had. Not from one emperor to one emperor to one emperor, but from the Holy One. His name. And it's written on you. the one who has paid the price for us all, the one who has loved us and gave himself for us. Jesus then concludes with the same command that he has given to all the churches and he gives to us. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you hearing? This is, a, this is a message that we really shouldn't be going out holding our heads down. This is a message where we can look up. God, you're coming back, and you're coming for me. 
if you're in Christ. We've been given truths today that the faithful believers, the faithful believers of every age have been promised. Our great sovereign, holy, and true God has promised to pour out blessings for us in this life and the life to come. We've been promised access to God. We've been promised opportunities to witness, to help others, to be missionaries for Him no matter where we live. We've been promised deliverance from a great time of trouble that will come upon the earth in the latter days. And we've been promised that we will dwell with God forever in His presence with His affirmation. Church, does this motivate you? Does this give you hope? As I said, I needed this this week. I need these truths every week. May we live as the church in Philadelphia did. May we live as pillars for our great King. Let's sing. Tremendous promises. Let's sing about the promises of God, huh? It's another standing song, I'm afraid, so hop on up. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, my Savior, through all eternal ages, let His praises ring. And we're going to do that. promised this morning, we are more than conquerors. And another one that I really want us to go out of this, uh, this service today, the change of our anticipation. We need to anticipate, I am coming soon. 
There's no time to waste. Live your life in full obedience for the glory of Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he give you peace. You're dismissed.